It's the end of summer and you know what that means. The leaves are changing and so are the ongoing anime, making this the perfect time to look back on summer's anime season. Now before we get started, I should clarify a few things. Firstly, that this is just my opinion, and secondly, that I haven't watched everything ongoing this season, so this list can only contain the things I've watched, part if not all of. In other words, sorry, but no food wars. If there's something that you think should be in here that isn't, leave a comment letting me know because I just might not have heard of it. So now that that's out of the way, welcome one and all, I'm Coriander Stone, and I present my Summer 2016 Awards. First off, let me give you my top 5 anime of the season, and then I'll have some special awards to give out afterward. Number 5 ReZero, or Re starting life in another world from zero. This is an anime that's impossible to talk about without giving at least spoilers through the end of episode 1 part 2, so if you want to go into the show completely unspoiled, please skip to the next number now. The story follows our average everyday normal protagonist, an average everyday normal Japanese high school student who suddenly gets thrown into an average ordinary, everyday fantasy world. The world and its characters are really nothing to write home about, with the exception of the one little plot twist thrown in. He dies. A lot. Every time our protagonist Subaru is killed, and he is killed quite often, he resets to a few days or a week or so earlier, depending on the part of the story he's in. These deaths and the plot twists surrounding them are what make ReZero good. But the show does have several major problems. Mainly, whenever it starts trying to focus on something that doesn't have to do with Subaru's death and rebirth cycle. The fact is that the world of ReZero just isn't all that original or interesting, and that means that whenever the show tries to focus on it, as opposed to the time loops, it's not very interesting. And you just want Subaru to hurry up and die again so you can get back to the darkness that makes the show so good. But despite its flaws and characters and setting, ReZero is still definitely a show worth watching, if only for its darker parts. Number 4 Survey. Talk about an anime that just screams fun. Fun characters, fun concepts, and fun watching them all play off each other. The anime follows vampires known as Servamps, who contract with human partners known as Eves. The vampire drinks the Eve's blood to grow stronger, and in return the Eve can command the vampire. The Servamps themselves are based off of the Seven Deadly Sins, insert necessary full metal alchemist reference. The story follows a new Servamp Eve pair, Shiro Tomahiro and the vampire Kuro, also known by his proper name as Sleepy Ash, the Servant of Sloth. As the two end up delving deep into Servant politics and ultimately end up in an all-out war with the vampire Tsubaki. Over the course of the story, Mahiro aligns himself and Kuro with many other Servant Eve pairs, while all the time seeking to understand Tsubaki's motives. All in all, the premise for Servant is honestly nothing special, but what takes this average everyday premise and turns it into a really good show are the characters. Servant has got to have one of the best casts of characters I've seen in a long time. The best part of this show is just watching its cast interact because they're all so fun and entertaining that you don't care if nothing particular is happening. All in all, Servant's this great mixture of comedy, action, and actually some really dark elements as well. And if you just want to sit back and watch some great characters interact, then I definitely recommend Servant. Number 3 91 Days. 91 Days is a mafia revenge story taking place in Prohibition America, somewhere around the New York, New Jersey area. When he was a child, our protagonist, Angela Laguza, watched his brother and parents brutally murdered before his eyes by the mafia. Seven years later, Angelo receives a letter from a mysterious person claiming to be a friend of his father's and giving to Angelo the names of his family's killers. Thus begins Angelo's journey to seek revenge against the Mafia family known as the Venettis. The story follows him as he works his way in close to the Venetti family and gets tangled up in the Mafia war then going on within the city known as Lawless. Dark, violent, twisted, and with an excellent character cast, 91 Days is a show that I definitely recommend. When I sat down to make this list, I knew exactly which two anime I wanted to put in this top two spots. The problem was choosing between them because they both have so much in common. Both anime are sequels that I've been waiting for for over a year. Both are sequels to anime that are already my top five favorite of all time. Both sequels outdid the original show. Both shows have two of my favorite casts of anime, and both sequels focused around development for some of the best characters within those casts. 
Heck, both shows have great animation, spectacular openings, and both featured endings by artists who I knew of because of their work on openings for the Fate series, To the Beginning and Ideal White, respectively. Both shows were full to bursting with well-executed plot twists, and honestly, I just couldn't decide which one I liked more. In my opinion, both shows were absolutely perfect, and so rather than arbitrarily picking one, I just decided to go ahead and give them both the number one slot. So for that reason, number one. D. Grayman Hallow D. Grayman is an anime series that aired back from 2006 to 2008. It was based on a manga by the same name. The story takes place back in the 1800s and follows a young exorcist called Alan Walker as he joins the Black Order. The Black Order is made up of exorcists who fight against the evil Millennium Earl, his monsters, the Akuma, and his accomplices, the family of Noah, as they kill people and create more Akuma in order to bring about the end of the world known as the Three Days of Darkness. D. Grayman Hallow picks up where the anime left off. Hallow mainly focuses on the Alma Karma arc, the arc that gives the backstory of one of the main characters, Yukanda, and also reveals both his dark twisted past and the blackness that gave the Black Order its black name. Hint, in this anime, there are no good guys. And while this show may have started off looking like your average long-running shonen, the Alma Karma arc and its aftermath are what finally reveal that D. Grayman is actually a psychological horror. Yet, as much as I adore Hallow, I have to say, do not watch Hallow unless you have watched both seasons of the original series. Trust me, watching it on its own would be a bad idea. That said, Hallow was a spectacular adaptation and one I highly suggest watching, if only after you finish the original series. Other number one. The Heroic Legend of Arslan, Dust Storm Dance, or if you prefer, Arslan Senki, Fujin Rambo. There's a reason that this series is seen as Japan's answer to The Lord of the Rings. Honestly, if there's ever been an anime that's worthy of comparison to Tolkien's epic masterpiece, it's this one. This season picks up about a month or so after the original season left off. And after watching it, I found one and only one glaring flaw, and that is, it's eight friggin' episodes long! This New Japan? Seriously? I wait over a year for this? The first season was 25 friggin' episodes! I mean, they couldn't even give us a full 12! Yeah, yeah, I know, they only needed eight episodes to adapt this arc. But the first season adapted three arcs, so why, why, why couldn't they have done that again? Now I've gotta wait a whole other year. That said, despite its poultry episode count, this season makes every episode count. Every episode has at least one major plot twist that came out of left field, and they were all executed perfectly. Additionally, several of the characters underwent spectacular development and none more than our main antagonist, Silver Mask, becoming a character who I honestly found myself rooting for, despite the fact that he's still out to destroy the main character, who I also love. But it's twists like that that make the heroic legend of Arslan such an amazing anime, and one I would definitely recommend. Now before I get to the positive awards, I have one negative anime award to give out, and that is my season nitpick. Essentially, this is really just something that bothered me this season. Be it a really bad protagonist for an otherwise good show, or something else that brought down the tone or quality of an already good show, or maybe it's a show in and of itself that could have been good but wasn't. In any case, my biggest nitpick for summer 2016 was... The A-Plot, from Tales of Zestiria, The X. My problem wasn't really with the entire Tales of Zestiria anime, but far more with what the anime chose to focus on. The best example of this is the two episodes that Tales of Zestiria, The X, devotes to adapting the beginning of another game, Tales of Berserxia. The idea being that the two take place in the same universe, and that the events of Tales of Berserxia are a direct prequel to Tales of Zestiria. But after watching these two episodes, episodes which, by the way, were easily the best of the series, I was left with one and only one burning question. Why the hell did Studio Ufotable choose to adapt Tales of Zestiria when they could have been adapting Tales of Berserxia instead? Everything about Berserxia looks better, from plot to premise to main character. It all just looks so much more appealing. But even Berserxia aside, there were so many more interesting characters to follow throughout this story than the main group. I mean, 
The first episode is from the point of view of Princess Alicia, who again was more interesting, seeming to be a curious combination of the naivete and personality of Code Geass's Princess Euphemia and the combat abilities of Arslan's Gi. Or how about that one merchant who turned out to be a badass assassin? All in all, there are so many more interesting things this show could have focused on, and I was continuously disappointed when we were dragged back to the main plot. Now, on with the positive awards. My top character of the season. This is a character who underwent massive development or was incredibly intriguing and enjoyable to watch, or both. There are a lot of good candidates out there, like Zisteria the Exes, Velvet Crow, Zervamp's Lawless, D. Greyman's Nea, who TBH is my favorite D. Greyman character, except for Jim Campy, of course, and Arslan's Prince Helmies. But at the end of the day, it had to be Yukanda from D. Greyman. Now, when I first decided to include this category on my list, I initially intended to give the award to Nea, who is, like I said, my favorite D. Greyman character. But a lot of the things that make him my favorite character are only revealed when he gets more screen time in the manga. Screen time, page time, well, anyway, I didn't think it would be really fair to put him on this slot. We've known there was something going on with Kanda since back in Season 1, when we first saw the hourglass and the lotus in his bedroom, but then we were never given any information as to what. Then, when he fights Skin in Season 2, he takes injuries that should have been fatal, and they aren't, raising even more questions about him. But it's not until now, when the Almakarma arc, that we learn about Kanda, his past, his motivations, and the shocking truth about his identity. But it's not only Kanda's backstory that warrants his inclusion on this list, but rather the way in which reliving some of his past and facing his memories allows him to grow and develop as a character in a spectacular way. Additionally, the arc explains so many little things about Kanda, from the reason he hates being referred to by his first name, to his friendship with Marie. And I'd better move on to the next award now before thinking about the Alma Karma arc too much makes me cry. The next award is a fairly self-explanatory one, the funniest moment of the season. And while Daryun vs. the Pirates from Arslan and Kuro and Mahiro's first meeting from Servant were both hilarious, there was a clear winner here. Mob Psycho 100. All of it. The entire show. Every single hilarious minute of it. My next award is for the best final episode of the season. The final episode of a season is incredibly important because it's what sets the tone for the way in which the audience remembers the show. Was everything wrapped up in an incredibly interesting and enjoyable way? Did a new plot twist leave them itching for more? Or do they just feel like they've been cheated? Typically, there are two ways in which an anime that is not yet complete will finish a season. It'll either end with a giant cliffhanger leaving you itching for more, like Code Geass R1, Fate Stay Night Unlimited Birdwork Season 1, or Himatora, or it'll try to wrap up in a way that feels relatively satisfying and ends the arc, even if the story itself is not yet complete, so things like K-Project Season 1, or the second incarnation of Jorora. However, I've never before seen an anime that manages to pull off both. And for that reason, my best ending of the season goes to... Walker from D. Grey Man Hallow. Considering that they couldn't finish the series since the manga is still ongoing, I was incredibly interested to see how they would end this season of D. Grey Man. Walker is broken up into three distinct sections. The first part is a piece of Alan's backstory that we've never seen before. What happened to him directly after Mana's death and how he became Cross's apprentice. The second part, Kanda's return, wraps up the development he's been going through throughout the season and also the Amakarma arc, as well as setting him up for his new role in the season to come. Finally, the episode actually ends by moving into the next arc, showing Alan alone, desperately on the run from the Akuma, and from the monster known as Apocryphos, this is the part I really love slash cry over. While setting up hype and anticipation to see what happens next, they also take it as a minute for Alan to reflect over all the things that have happened in the season and in general, thinking about Mana, about Cross, and about the secret meaning of the instructions Mana left for him. Don't stop, keep walking. And it's this use of reflection that makes the ending feel so fitting. Finally concluding with a shot of Alan getting up and walking forward that parallels a shot of him at the end of episode 1 of the initial season, walking toward the Black Order for the very first time. <laughs>